Okay, so this hypothesis test is related to aptitude tests before and after going on a training course. Um, and we wanna know if any change is taking place at the 5% level. So, I'll paraphrase that by saying any significant change. All right, now, we're looking at a before and after situation. All right, so we're looking at match pairs t-test. All right, so the assumptions and conditions Go back to the first page, take a look. You'll see for the match pairs, we're looking at pretty much the same thing as a t-test. The only difference is that there's references to both. So simple random samples, n is greater than 30 or it's a normal distribution. We don't know what sigma is, so we use s. Also, you know, it have to be match pairs, but aside from that, uh, everything is pretty much the same as a t-test. All right, so we'll take a look. We have only, let me take a quick look here. I believe it was seven values. Uh, not even close, so nine values. Um, doesn't say anything about a normal distribution. So we have to assume a normal distribution. Uh, scores on aptitude tests before and after Going to doesn't say anything about randomization, so we have to assume that it's a simple random sample. Right. Um, we don't know what sigma is. And we do know that it's matched pairs. All right, so we have two verifiable assumptions making these conditions, and we only have two um, that we have to actually assume. Right? If we're looking for a significant change, then we're looking for a difference between the two population means. So mu sub 1 equal to mu sub 2. Oh, that's not a 2. Equal to mu sub 2 is our null. Mu sub 1 not equal to mu sub 2 would be our alternative corresponds to a two-tailed test. Five percent level, All right? Um, we also have a slightly different, oh, I hate when that happens, slightly different formula for our test statistic. T is gonna be equal to X bar sub D minus mu sub d over s sub d over the square root of n. All right. So 5% uh, level, so 0 0.025 on either fringe. And come up with that value because we know that n is equal to 9. So my degrees of freedom was one less than that, so eight. Uh, let me actually quit out of here before I do that. So uh, inverse T, 0 0.025 with eight degrees of freedom, negative point two, a negative two point three zero six. And same thing with two, uh, positive T. Right. So that edit in my L3, I'm going to do an L1 minus L2. That gives me my mean differences. And then I'm going to run a 
one variable stats on L3. It gives me my X bar, which is somehow negative five, which is interesting. I'll pop that in. Mu sub D, the assumed difference between the means should be zero. S is going to be the 9.206-ish. Over the square root of 9. All right, so we'll get an approximate value here, but I'm going to use, like we always do, the true values that are stored in the calculator instead of just, you know, roughing it out here. Oops. So, use my fractional tool, bars. Again, it's option 5 in the bars menu for statistics. X bar, I don't need minus anything because it's just zero. Divided by vars, option five, SX. I could just uh, square root of nine. Uh, the number of pairs is nine. So square root of nine is three. So I'll just type in the divided by three. So we're looking at approximately negative 1.629. To get the p-value that goes along with that, again, it's the TCDF. I've done this a bunch of times, so you can refer to past videos if you want more information on that. But I'm going to run through the processes on the calculator anyway. So second bars, TCDF. Mine is nice. It brings up the, you know, the actual thing that you need, you know, like all the items that you need to type in. Um, because my negative 1.629 falls on the left side of the graph, that's my upper bound with the lower bound being something extremely negative. And just like I forgot to do in every other video, let me store that in as some dummy variable so that I don't have to worry about retyping it. All right. You know, there's other ways to handle it, but I think that's the most convenient way. So something negatively large, you know, absolute value is large, comma, A. And we need my degrees of freedom, which is, for whatever reason, abbreviated with a V on this. Um, degrees of freedom is 8. And that gives me my p-value of approximately 0 0.0709. All right, so in either case, we're getting across the idea that we should not be rejecting the null hypothesis because the, neg the negative 1.629 does not fall in the shaded area and the 0 0.0709 is not less than the stated alpha value of 0.05. Uh, so there is insufficient evidence. Uh, let me zoom in like crazy here. To reject the claim that they're talking about any change taking place. Hmm. Potential typo? Is that right? It feels weird. Taken place? Yeah, no, I think that's right. All right, well, keep an eye out for typos. Typo bonus is still on the table. We're talking about the difference in mean score before and after taking some sort of assessment. Uh, I'm sorry, before some sort of training. All right, so let me get rid of this schmutz that I'm getting on the screen here. Insufficient evidence to reject the claim that there is no difference In score, uh, population mean score,
before and after training. at the 0.05 significance level. Now, the question of has any change taken place at the 5% level? So any change corresponds to a significant difference. I think we're gonna need that follow-up sentence. So therefore the claim of, the claim that there is a significant difference is going to be false and so now we can answer their question all right so and i just got to keep reminding myself what the question was has any change taken place at the five percent level so therefore or we already used therefore so no change has taken, still feels weird, place at the 5% level. I'll take it as a typo. These, um, these boxes, the conclusion boxes could be spaced out a little bit better, I think. Because I'm always struggling to fit in what I need to fit in. All right, so first come, first serve on that. And it's a good way for me to know if anybody's 